Good evening. I'm Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University Museums at the University of Richmond. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the lecture and reception for our exhibition, Edward Weston, Portrait of the Young Man as an Artist, in the Joel and Lila Harnett Museum of Art. We are also opening three other exhibitions tonight, so we have other things for you to see as well. Uh, Infinite Choices, Abstract Drawings by Al Held, Man Up, Man Down, Images of Masculinity from the Harnett Print Study Center Collection, and our annual student exhibition uh, in collaboration with the Department of Art and Art History here at the university. The Weston exhibition was curated by Graham Howell and first opened at the Monterey Museum of Art. The exhibition tour was originated by curatorial assistants traveling exhibitions with loans from the Monterey Museum of Art, the Monterey Peninsula College, and the Bolt Chandler family. The exhibition and related programs are made possible in part with funds from the Lewis S. Booth Arts Fund. This fantastic exhibition includes more than 120 <laughs> photographs and they range in date from 1903 to 1946. It includes his earliest photographs with later works from his career, including several of his iconic images, giving us the opportunity to understand his development in terms of subject matter, style, and explorations. I mentioned the curator Graham Howe, but I would like to, to give special acknowledgement and thanks to our University Museum staff, who together have worked with the curator's selection and have created a spectacular experience for you in the Harnett Museum. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge Elizabeth Schlater, our deputy director and curator of exhibitions, who was the project director for the organization of how this exhibition is presented in our gallery spaces. Remember, I mentioned there are over 120 photographs, which means there are close to that many frames to consider for our installation. Elizabeth was the project curator, making choices about the themes and arrangement of the many works and developing other aspects to heighten our experience of Weston's incredible images. For all of our exhibitions, but in particular for this project, we enlisted all of our staff in this beautiful installation uh, in making it, it a reality. The excellent exhibition design and and actual installation are the responsibilities of Steve Duggins and Henley Guile. A more interactive experience of the exhibition was the work of our education and program specialists, Heather Campbell and Martha Wright. And you will find certain areas where the label uh, is headlined with art and the senses. So be sure to check out those components of the exhibition. Technology and other behind the scenes aspects could not have happened without the dedicated work of Katrina Clark, David Hershey, and Matthew Howe. Thanks to each of you for uh, this very special exhibition that you'll see tonight. Generally, to open an exhibition, we, we bring in the curator or a visiting scholar to speak on the art we are presenting. Who knew that, that we had such an expert on Weston right down the road here in Richmond? We, we soon found that, that out. It is my great pleasure to introduce Alex Narges, our speaker this evening. Earlier, I joked with him that he needs no introduction, which is very true for, for us here in, in the theater. But I'll mention a few things that perhaps will be new to you. Now in his 13th year as director, of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, he leads one of the nation's top comprehensive art museums, a museum that just happens to be the university's neighbor, and you couldn't ask for a better neighbor uh, to have in Richmond. I'm still thrilled that he was able to take some time out from his responsibilities to speak with us tonight. Alex came to the VMFA from the Dayton Art Institute, where he was director and CEO from 1992 to 2006, a position he also held previously at the Mississippi Museum of Art and the Florida DeLand Museum of Art. 
A native of Rochester, New York, he has both a master's degree in museum studies and an undergraduate degree in American civilization and in anthropology and archeology span from George Washington University in Washington, DC. Alex writes and lectures widely on photography and has curated and organized many exhibitions. And here's the good part of, of this for this evening. It includes the exhibition titled Edward Weston, A Photographer's Love of Life, presented initially at the Dayton Art Institute, and he told me that it traveled to five other museums. He is a former board member of the Association of Art Museum Directors and an active board member of the French American Museum Exchange. In 2014, he was appointed by the French government as a Knight in the Order of Arts and Letters for his contribution to furthering art in France and throughout the world. In addition to being a photography historian, he is an accomplished photographer in his own right. And I know he brings the artist's eye to what he will be telling us this evening. The title of his talk is Edward Weston, Lover of Life. Following the talk, we will have time for some questions, and then please join us in the Harnett Museum of Art to see this exhibition and to enjoy the reception in the booth lobby. Please join me in welcoming Alex Narges. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, Richard, thank you for inviting me here. And thank you for bringing Edward Weston to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I happen to have a great love affair for photography. Now, being born in Rochester, New York, you can't leave the hospital without taking a picture, developing it, and then printing it. Um, and uh, every, it, photography permeates everything. And as a kid, um, I would take, ride my bicycle up to the George Eastman house and go there every day in the summer at one o'clock. They would show movies in the Dryden Theater. And then in those days, I could wander around the museum. Uh, and so my love of photography started very early. Uh, and you'll hear in a moment that same love for photography started early for Edward Weston. Uh, I had the good fortune at my last museum to know Edward Weston's grand nephew who, because of his grandmother, uh, Mary, and you'll hear more about her in a moment, uh, and uh, her famous brother, this collection, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a bit, um, was there in a closet not being tended. So I had the great privilege of being able to pull together a major exhibition of Weston who had long, long been one of my great heroes in photography, both personally but as a photo historian as well, and was able to do a, a book and exhibition uh, that uh, gave me great joy. So when Richard called and said, uh, Alex, we're, we're doing this opening, uh, would you be willing to come lecture? And I was like, oh gosh, talk about Edward Weston? I'll be there in a heartbeat. And then he said, it's on Thursday, the 30th of August. And I said, oh, well, that won't work because I'm gonna be on a plane. And Richard said, let me get back to you. And he did, he calls me a couple days later, said, we've moved the opening lecture to the day before. And I thought, wow, what a nice guy. I knew you were a nice guy to begin with, but that was extra special nice. Uh, I wanna congratulate you too on the installation and Elizabeth and all the staff. It's a gorgeous exhibition. I'm gonna include a number of photographs from this exhibition in the uh, talk you'll hear tonight. Um, but my goal, quite frankly, is two things. One, to give you a sense of the life and the work of Edward Weston. So I'm gonna go beyond the boundaries of this show. Uh, I'm gonna do it chronologically. So by the end of, of the slides and the talk, you should have a very good sense of the photographer, but also the man behind the camera because he's one of the most fascinating uh, characters as an artist uh, that quite frankly, I've ever come to know. And I never did know him. I, 
I was born in 1957. He died January 1958, and our paths did not cross. However, at least not at least not maybe spiritually, uh, but I've, I've known uh, a number of his, his family members, uh, his grandson, Kim, who lives at Wildcat Hill, but then also uh, Cole, uh, Karis, uh, his wife, and you'll see uh, a number of these people uh, in the exhibition. The other piece of this, though, that I want you to uh, leave with is really the central, central part of this, which is this lover of life. Through the years, in fact, after, uh, more so uh, after he died, uh, lore and legend, uh, most of it not true, grew up about Edward Weston and his work. And a picture was painted of Weston, Weston as being rem remorse. Uh, he was dark. Uh, and there were so many things that were not necessarily true. And no photographer... Uh, or very few photographers l have left as many direct uh, materials for us to use as resources. The Great Day Books, which is a two-volume set of part of his writings, at least the ones that he didn't destroy, um, really give us the voice. So uh, normally, uh, for those of you who heard me talk about anything before, I don't stand behind a podium because I like to wander and, and get closer to all of you, but tonight, I'm going to let Weston's voice talk a lot because you need to hear his words, particularly as they relate to the images that you'll see uh, on the screen. So join me on a journey to learn about Edward Weston, uh, really one of the great photographers, if not the greatest photographer uh, of all time. And let me just say that on that notion, Weston would probably be upset because he did not believe it possible that anybody could be the best at. In fact, what was really his patent phrase, and I, I use this to this day, when he saw a photograph that he loved by another photographer, it's a phrase that is so lovely. He said, I wish I had taken that. And next time you see a photograph or a painting, if you take photographs or paint or sculpt, Think about that phrase because it really does express the highest form of compliment, and he used it a lot. Um, this exhibition, by the way, is, is spectacular. There are 120 photographs. It really does give you, and they've organized it in a, in a wonderful way that I think will help you dive deeper. So the, the marriage of getting this chronological journey through his life and then seeing this exhibition, which is beautifully installed and beautifully framed, uh, and I will say I really liked the experiential parts. In fact, there are parts with touch, there are parts with smell, uh, and you will, you will actually be able to dive deeper into the work of Edward Weston. Now, his inspirations are many, and one of the nice things about this exhibition is you get to see the early Edward Weston a great deal. Uh, on the screen is Edward on the right, and then his sister Mary. Uh, Mary uh, was his older sister. Uh, Edward was born in Lake Forest, Illinois, uh, just outside of Chicago in 1886. His father was a literary doctor. His grandfather was a medical doctor. But his mother died when he was only five. And Mary, who he called May uh, often, uh, becomes his surrogate mother. She also becomes his greatest champion throughout his career and really one of his great inspirations. Um, and a little aside, when I met Jack Weston, uh, Mary's uh, grandson, um, he told me the story that Edward Weston promised his sister, and very early on, gifts. And he would give her photographs, one after the other, until they were just dozens and then hundreds of photographs. And over the years, he would mail her photographs. Sometimes he would fold them because they were test prints. But um, Jack is then visiting his Aunt Jean, Mary's daughter, and comes upon in a closet, this is in Glendale, California, pile this tall of photographs and photograph boxes. And he says, Aunt Jean, what's, what is this? And she says, oh, those are pictures Uncle Ed sent to my mother. 
we're talking in the photography world, vintage means they were taken and then printed at the time of the photograph. These are all vintage because he gave them to his sister. Uh, probably the most remarkable collection of Weston that I know of, and, and the centers at the, in Tucson, the Getty, uh, the Huntington in California uh, are amazing collections as well. But I had the privilege of them working with some of the most beautiful uh, early pictures. So Mary becomes this great champion, but his father, uh, when he's 16, year old, 16 years old, gives him a Kodak camera. Now, how many people in the audience, when you're young, you get a Kodak camera because that was what you did, and you start snapping pictures? Well, he writes his dad, because he's off uh, during the summer to a family farm in Michigan. Dear Papa, receive the camera in good shape. It's a dandy. Took a snap at the chickens. I think it's a good one. Tomorrow, I intend to take the house when the sun is right. I see a fine picture in the mirror from the ridge looking down. Your loving son, Ed. Okay, this is a 16-year-old articulating what professional photographers, artists think and do regularly. And it's his first camera. So you can see where this young genius, as I would call him, with a camera had started on that very first time. Now, years later, uh, Weston reminisced, I remember the day my father gave me my first camera, one of Mr. Eastman's new Kodaks. And this is important. My life was changed from that day. I was in love with photography. Here you see uh, Weston and his sister, Mary Weston Seaman. Uh, about the time of this photograph in 1906, she marries a fellow by the name of John Seaman, and they relocate from Chicago down to Tropico, California. Now, if you haven't heard of Tropico, it's okay because they now call it Glendale. Um, and at the time, it was a dusty, distant suburb of Los Angeles, which you can imagine in 1906 was relatively small. It's long before the movie industry, long before uh, industry in general, uh, or much of anything else. Now, Mary's dream was to bring her brother, who was still living in Chicago, to California. Remember, it's just the two of them. So she begins this campaign of letter writing. And in one of her letters, she says, I can't think of anything but your coming. I'll have a little screen room built for you so you can have your pet scheme of sleeping outdoors all year round. I mean, for a week. Weston uh, is then lured because she paints this luscious picture. Uh, and here you see uh, Edward Weston uh, with his uh, sister, Mary. And that's not a uh, fake picture. He was very much into physical fitness uh, and health. Uh, and, you know, this is the beginning of the, night, the 20th century. But she paints this luscious picture of the bounty of things like peaches. And she writes, I ordered 10 pounds at the grocery store and got five peaches. Then she likewise boasts, cream so thick, we have to thin it out before it will pour. Well, where she gets her brother Edward, though, is her description of the California landscape. And one of the great things of this show is you see some early pictures in the 2000, or 1904, 1906, 1907 that Weston has taken with probably that same Kodak box camera of the landscape. And you see this young Weston with an eye that does mature, but it's already there. And so she says, where mountains make the grandest dark outline against the sky. Oh, these mountains, you will be wild over them. And you know what? Her words work. Uh, he packs up and moves to California, 1906, and it becomes a lifelong love affair with California. And he doesn't necessarily think of himself as an artist. He is interested in working in photography. But other than nine months, when he goes back to Chicago in 1908 to go to photography school. 
and then a couple of sojourns to Mexico, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, in the 1920s. And then in 1941, he takes an epic journey, which I'll also uh, draw into the conversation. California's his home for the next 50 years. And to think of Weston without California, it's, it's unimaginable. And New York, the center of the universe when it comes to art, even photography, uh, but what he did to help establish California as a bastion for modernism is so very important. Here you see a picture from the exhibition in 1907, the San Gabriel Mountains in California. So he's already taking pictures, and this is just a little contact print. He uh, sets down roots in Glendale, in Tropico, and after a couple of stints of working in photography studios, he hangs out his own shingle. Now, he's introduced to this charming young lady by the name of Flora Chandler, who's part of the Chandler family, a wealthy family that uh, at one time owned the uh, Los Angeles Times. And they marry and are soon blessed with four uh, boys. And several of them become uh, photographers of considerable note. Now, this is a very modest beginning, but this is the home of Edward and Flora Weston in 1910. His studio was a tiny little bungalow of even more modest proportions that uh, gives you a sense of Weston and his life. But what's important to know about Edward Weston is that material possessions were never important. He didn't pursue money or fame or fortune. He was in love with photography and taking pictures and then sharing them so that people could enjoy them. When he dies in 1958, his home is up at Wildcat Hill, south of Carmel, and it is a very rustic house, and you'll see a picture later of it so you'll understand how rustic I mean. He has $50 in his bank account, and that's it. Western photographs today regularly sell for over a million dollars. He would have had no idea. He probably would have been appalled, quite frankly. Weston uh, was one who adopted the style uh, prevalent at the time uh, called pictorialism. And pictorialism is where romantic images, soft focused, uh, non-glossy paper uh, were part of, of the, the photography mainstream. And he used uh, his family members. Uh, you see Flora, his wife here, in this highly romanticized image. Uh, and then uh, his son Chandler, his oldest son, uh, this work from about 1913. Um, but he also attracted a steady clientele. His uh, work, though, always then veers into what he wants to do artistically. He's making money off of portraits, but he does other things like this image of peaches from 1915 that's in the exhibition. This poetic, soft style that typifies pictorialism um, are masterpieces. And he, interestingly enough though, later disavows any association with having ever done pictorialist work. Uh, in fact, he would destroy most of those glass plates. In fact, there's uh, an apocryphal story that uh, Weston and his sons would often tell. And it was, he would take pictures on eight by 10 glass plate negatives. He would later scrape the emulsion off, the negatives would be gone, and he would use it to replace the panes in windows and doors. <laughs> Weston won awards across the country as a pictorialist photographer, uh, and in Europe too, the London Photographic Salon, the honorary secretary, Bertram Park, deemed, and I quote, the best group of photographs by the same artist at the salon was by Edward H. Weston of California. And you can see why uh, he was so highly regarded. Uh, this is a, a standing female nude from 1919. Um, I mean, the drama, the romance was all a part of it. But you'll see a dramatic change here uh, in just a little bit. Uh, 
Edward Weston with his father. This is, by the way, a self-portrait. He's holding a cord to take the picture. And then his sister, uh, Mary, on the right. A great image of his son, uh, Brett. Brett follows his father as a photographer. Cole does as well. Arguably, Brett is every bit a good as photographer as his father. And one could actually argue they may have been better. An amazing career as well. His son, Chan, uh, in 1919. Now, he had the successful studio. He reveled in the avant-garde of the uh, world of, of Los Angeles. If you see portraits of him, he's wearing an ascot. He very much looks the part of the photographer, even wore a beret at times. Um, but, but all of that is going to change. And, and probably the line that changes it is when in 1922 he goes to Middletown, Ohio. And Middletown is just north of Cincinnati, an industrial town. His sister Mary and his brother-in-law John had moved there. Uh, and he goes there and he takes five photographs of Armco Steel. It's the American Rolling Mill Company. This is quintessential modernism. And it's almost overnight that he makes this transition from the pictorialism, and you can see the stark difference in why he would later disavow ever having done those romantic images. And this transformation to one of the great modernists of all time with these cool, stark images, industrial scenes, scenes of architecture uh, are, are just absolutely fabulous. He ventures on to New York, his sister encourages him, gives him some money, and there, uh, in New York for the first time, he goes to meet Alfred Stieglitz, legendary by this time, gallery owner, photographer of major proportions in his own right, publisher, and then the ultimate critic of photography in the world. Uh, Weston's work, surprisingly, is not well received by Alfred Stieglitz, in fact, with great reservation. Weston's turned off by Stieglitz. In fact, he's turned off by New York, and it'd be two more decades before he would go back. It only helps to solidify his love for California. Now, he goes back to California, uh, and, and one of the, the prevalent stories that is true is about Edward Weston and his love for women. Uh, in addition to his wife, Flora, that is. And uh, there were a series of women in his life uh, throughout uh, the time until later when Karis comes into his life. Uh, and Weston is at, in a struggle with the world. He's moving from a pictorialist photographer. He is never keen on doing all of this portrait work for money to pay the bills. Uh, and he decides to make the ultimate separation. And one of his protégés and one of his lovers is a, a young lady by the name of Tina Madotti. And Tina is a movie actress. Uh, she is an aspiring photographer. And Weston picks up and decides to move to Mexico. And one of, the, one of his great uh, friends to be is Diego Rivera. Uh, and he abandons pictorialism. He abandons his family to some degree, although he brings his oldest son Chandler with him, and he's gone for a year and a half taking photographs. Uh, and in doing so, uh, the world for Weston changes. Here you see Tina Madotti, but just her hands. You want to talk about a powerful modernist image and he's using the decoration in her uh, dress, but the hands and the positioning and then the contrast uh, are every bit the modern world. His work was warmly received. In fact, a uh, newspaper headline blared, Weston, the emperor of photography, has a Latin soul despite his birth in North America. Now, apparently, at the time, Mexico didn't think it was in North America. Um, but Diego Rivera, Diego Rivera, legendary muralist and painter, uh, and by the way, a great lover and philanderer himself. No wonder they got along, right? I mean, they, 
they had similar passions, passions for art, passions for women. Um, few are the modern plastic expressions that give me purer or more intense joy than the masterpieces that are frequently produced in the work of Edward Weston. And I confess that I prefer the productions of this great artist to the majority of significant paintings. I mean, for Diego Rivera to say that about photographs and photographers is just truly amazing. Uh, his work in Mexico includes uh, this work, uh, which is a, a titled 40 Cent Horse from 1924. And about this time, Weston is beginning to write uh, more in his day books that have survived. His earlier day books, and he was a, a, a wonderful writer keeping logs of his days, and you're going to hear a lot as we look now at more photographs that coincide with the day books. Um, but he destroyed the earlier versions, and that demarcation of moving to Mexico is so important to him that he essentially wiped out the earlier uh, chapter of his life just as he did by scraping the emulsions off those negatives. Now, in Mexico, uh, he says, I should be photographing more steel mills or paper factories, but here I am in romantic Mexico, and willy-nilly, one is influenced by surroundings. I can say at least, to be genuine, life here is intense and dramatic, but I do not need to photograph premeditated postures, and there are sunlit walls of fascinating surface textures, and there are clouds. They alone are sufficient to work with for many months and never tire. So you can imagine, here's this guy with his camera, free for the first time in his life as an artist to take pictures that he wants to take. Now, this is that bridge, though, still with pictorialism, because as you see in this uh, image, and this next one, which is uh, uh, humorly called Panchito Villa. Uh, and he's using, using a matte paper, so there's no gloss. He's using a toned paper. And in most cases like this, it's a platinum print. And platinum prints, uh, traditionally in the first part of the 20th century, were, uh, was prized by the pictorialist photographers. So we see this bridge. And he continues to use it until he makes then a break from Mexico in 1926. He leaves, never to go back, and he leaves Tina Madati there as well. Now, she goes on to a fabulous career as a photographer, as a lover to a, a number of other artists. Uh, and then, un and sadly, in about 1940, she's found dead in a cab. Uh, and one could only imagine the heartbreak uh, for Weston at that news. Um, he goes back to California. And here's where we see the Weston that we know and are constantly inspired by and have been inspired by for uh, the last uh, nearly a century, because this is from 1927, uh, one of his Nautilus shells. He goes back to Los Angeles and tries to reconcile with his wife, Flora. It didn't go well, and he, it, we knew it wasn't gonna go well, right? I, sadly, sadly for her and, and for him, and of course, you know, they have, they have four boys, so it's not particularly easy in, in any case, but he ends up then leaving and going to Northern California up to the San Francisco Bay Area. Had that not happened, we might not know this Western. In fact, I can almost guarantee it. Because the fortuitous moment was we, when he met a painter that most of you probably will never hear of, other than tonight, uh, a woman by the name of Henrietta Shore. She was a painter who introduced him to the beauty and the majesty of Nautilus shells. And it had just never crossed his path that way before. And so he becomes so enamored. And here he records in his day books, the shells I photographed were so marvelous, one could not do other than something of interest. What I did may be only a beginning. How little would he have known that those prophetic words 
would be repeated over and over again in literature and in uh, evenings like tonight. Because without Weston and his Nautilus shells, I'm not sure where his legacy would be or if there would be any. Uh, but you have to put this in the context of the time because the photographs that people were seeing up till then, with a few exceptions of Strand and Stieglitz and a few others who had adopted modernism, but nothing like this, nothing looking at nature so close and in such a unique fashion. He sends photographs of shells to Tina in, in uh, Mexico, and she writes back, my God, Edward, your last photography surely took my breath away. I feel speechless in front of them. What purity of vision. When I opened the package, I couldn't look at them very long. They stirred up all my innermost feelings so that I felt a physical pain. Now, 90 years later, it's hard for us to look at these and understand how startlingly modern and different that they were. But go back for a moment and think about what she says because he's extracting new meaning from nature in an abstract way that is so inspiring and so startlingly new uh, that it really gets that kind of stir. Now, one of the aspects about uh, Edward Weston that's greatly misunderstood in addition to this dark side is his penchant to be fixated on eroticism, that he was so much looking for these things. And here we see in the exhibition, Pepper number 30 from 1925 or 29, eroticism was not Weston's intention. Yet many writers for a long number of years claim that despite the fact that his own words said something very different. In fact, I'll read you what he said. No, with an exclamation point. I had no physical thoughts, never have. I worked with clearer vision of sheer aesthetic form. I knew that I was recording from within my feeling of life as I never had before. And stop and think about what he's saying. Sheer aesthetic form. He's not talking about an erotic nature. I mean, this is one of the reasons, and there was a, a book done by uh, Ben Maddow, a biography, that helped to perpetuate this for a generation and a half. And this lover of life, this lover of, of abstraction and beauty that he was seeing and wanting to share was getting lost in, in, in this uh, cloud. Um, now, Pepper's provided this great uh, source of inspiration for him. Uh, he said, endless variety of manifestations. Because of their extraordinary surface texture, because of power, the force suggested in their amazing convolutions. Peppers never repeat themselves. Next time you go to the grocery store, you have an assignment. Go to the pepper section and look at the peppers. Unfortunately, a lot of peppers are now grown and I think they make them in a plastic mold. They may actually have come off a 3D <laughs> printer. But look at real peppers. Go to, go to the farmer's market south of the river and look at peppers there and you'll see what Weston's talking about. He says, peppers never repeat themselves. Shells, bananas, melons, so many other forms are not inclined to experiment. Not so the pepper. Always excitingly individual. You can see him in his studio up at Wildcat Hill taking pictures of peppers. Now, there's a piece of Western lore that uh, is legendary, and he wrote about it. Um, green peppers in the market stopped me. They were amazing in every sense of the word. The three purchased. But a tragedy took place. Brett ate two of them. Now again, look at this and think about it as his study of nature, about abstraction in nature, not a sculptor creating this, but nature doing it and then him capturing a photograph, obviously taking a great deal of time to create the setting, the right lighting in his studio to 
capture this in a way that excites us. Now, when people look at this, they raise the question, don't you see the couple embracing? You know, and there's, there's that whole business of the erotic. Well, this is Weston's words, just to put it to rest. Of course I saw that, but I took the photograph in spite of it. <laughs> okay? Now bananas. Bananas provided a similar inspiration. This is from his day books. 5 a.m., though I was awake at 4, with my mind full of banana forms, exclamation point, I am torn between two loves, bananas and shells. <laughs> okay, who woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning today thinking about bananas? Anybody? Probably not. That's why he was such a great photographer and artist. He gets so deeply immersed into his subject matter and the inspiration from a visual and aesthetic standpoint. Now, a photograph by Edward Weston that I consider to be his most elegant, his most poetic, and, I, and quite frankly, my absolute favorite, is an abstraction uh, where he again looks at the inherent beauty of nature. Uh, and here, though, is yet another time when people look, and you'll see a number of versions, uh, both of the time that this photograph was taken in 1931 and then later, because he took a lot of pictures of dead birds, dead people, uh, graves. And what rises from this is this, this erroneous myth of him being obsessed with death. And quite to the contrary, uh, he was obsessed with life. And in his own words, the celebration of all that was living is this. To find a dead pelican, photograph a few inches of its wing so that white quills dart from black barbs like rays of light cutting a night sky. This is not copying nature, but using her with an imaginative intent to a definite end. I mean, get the aesthetic drive that is creating the photograph behind. You've got stone to the upper left, the uh, quills of the pelican, and then the feathers. And of course, he's lit it outside. This is, this is taken on a tripod with his 8x10 camera. And it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's the quintessential Western abstraction of nature, but it's a celebration of life. Well, Western life takes a turn for even better because in 1934, he meets the charming and alluring daughter of a playwright and successful author, uh, Karis Wilson. She lives in Carmel. Now, Weston, if you're doing the math, he was born in 1886. Uh, this is 1934. He's 48. She's 19. It's like Bogey and Bacall, <laughs> except better. Um, she becomes the great love of his life. He finally divorces Flora, uh, marries Karis, uh, and together they, they take a trek uh, that is really the largest and most important body of his work, other than that time period in 1927-28 when he first ventures into nature. Uh, he takes these pictures of sand dunes, and then of course his great love, Karis, uh, one of the most important nude uh, photographs uh, ever taken. In 1937, he's awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, hugely important because no photographer had ever won one before. It also carries a $2,000 stipend, so he's completely freed from the studio and having to earn a living. He buys a car, and by the way, he never learned how to drive. His sons drove him, his wife drove him, Karis later as his wife drove him, and they take off on an epic journey. And remember, he's not driving, they're camping out, they're staying in motels, um, and he's able to concentrate solely on his art. Uh, during the next two years, because he wins a second Guggenheim Fellowship the next year, a $2,000 stipend twice. They travel 25,000 miles 
through California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, New Mexico, and Arizona, and in the process, create 1,500 negatives. Now, he's sending these negatives back in the mail, brave soul, um, and to his son who's printing them because he doesn't have the facilities out there in the desert. Um, here's a picture from that same quest uh, where it's a, mo a mold uh, model from 1936. And his goal in all of this is really simple. The recognition recording and presentation of the interdependence, the relativity of all things, and then underlined the universality of basic form. And here you see a child's grave from 1937. In a single day's work within the radius of a mile, I might discover and record the skeleton of a bird, a blossoming fruit tree, a cloud, a smokestack, each of these being not only a part of the whole, but each in itself becoming a symbol for the whole of life. So here you get a better sense of this lover of life. Now, his neighbor and close friend is Ansel Adams, and this is a work uh, by Weston when he goes to visit him. Um, and he goes to visit him up uh, at Lake Tanaya, this great photograph from 1937, and then visits him in Yosemite where Adams has his studio. His wife, uh, Virginia Best, they had this uh, photography studio uh, before they married. Uh, he takes it over, and they go up one time when it's absolutely warm and brown during the middle of the winter, and he's heartbroken. But he wakes up one morning, and lo and behold, it had snowed uh, and this two-day snowfall results in there was something to photograph, trees top-heavy with snow, buildings mantled with thick white overroofs, wires built up with snow until they looked like tree branches. He continues on to a place called Rhyolite, uh, Nevada, which was once a booming mining town, and now it's a ghost town. He considered it Athens, the Athens of Nevada, uh, Karis, on the other hand, called it a ghost town at its nakedest. He goes to the coast, the north coast at Crescent Beach and takes a picture of this wrecked car. Uh, and this is, again, another example of, of what I consider to be his best work. I mean, the composition itself, the contrast, the gradation of the sea and the mist that's coming in, the material strewn on the sand in front of you is just, it's absolutely glorious from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, Weston looked at this and said this very simply. It was a wrecked car that needed doing. Uh, clouds from Death Valley in 1939. Uh, and he visualized these subjects before he takes the picture. He looks at something looks it through the camera and doesn't crop, doesn't really manipulate, in fact, does very little in the dark room other than some uh, burning and dodging, and then prints everything as a contact print, the size of, of the negative. 1941, he takes off on the sec second epic journey of his life. Uh, he was given a commission by the limited edition clubs of New York to illustrate a new volume of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Now, at first he was hesitant and wrote the publisher, there will be no attempt to illustrate, in quotation marks. No symbolism, except perhaps in a very broad sense. No effort to recapture Whitman's day. The reproductions will have no titles, no captions. This leaves me great freedom. I can use anything from an airplane to a longshoreman, and I will never please everyone with my America. Wouldn't try to. He goes across the south to uh, Louisiana, 19,000 miles, 24 states starting California, making his way through Texas, Louisiana, up to Maine and Georgia, 800 negatives along the way. Now, while he's doing that, and here we have an image from a plantation ruins in Louisiana, he leaves California for this long journey and not quite sure how long he's gonna be gone. Eight months, 10 months, two years? But Mary, who by this time is back in Los Angeles, had suffered a paralyzing stroke and was destitute that her brother was going to leave 
California. Now he's living further north and she's back down in Glendale, but he promises the remedy, I'll write you. And he sends these picture postcards that he sends sometimes every day, three or four a week, to, to be in touch with her. He ends up sending some 800 postcards across this journey. Uh, the editor uh, of the book wasn't any less uh, worried and had a high degree of concern. And Weston wrote him, look, it's my feeling that the only photographs worthy to go in an edition of Leaves of Grass are those that will present the same kind of broad, inclusive summation of contemporary America that Whitman himself gave. And I tell you what, it's a classic book. He goes back to Middletown for the first time in 20, since 1922 uh, and takes this great image, uh, ventures a little further north and encounters a um, tourist attraction uh, at a bottle farm uh, that is done by a folk artist by the name of Winter Zero Schwartzel. You gotta love the name. Um, but he takes these images, then continues on to Connecticut in this great journey where he goes to visit his great friend, the fellow photographer, but also painter, uh, Charles Sheeler. You look at this and it looks like a Sheeler, partly an homage to Sheeler, partly an influence of his friend and a photograph that although he took, probably if Sheeler had taken it, he would have said, I wish I took that. Now, when he's going to take this barn, uh, Karis recalled this in her autobiography, one fine red barn and silo in Brookfield had been painted earlier by Sheeler for a Fortune magazine cover. When he and Edward went in to ask the owner if it was all right for Edward to make a photograph of her barn, the lady complained a painter had been there a while back, had done the place, and she didn't get anything out of it. And lo and behold, what'd you know, the painting came out on the cover of a magazine, and she had it right there in the living room, and she was ready to show you. Edward said, look, if I get a photograph, I will send it to you. And he did. Uh, in Georgia, uh, he takes portraits. He goes to visit his great friend Jean Charlot and his wife from their days in Mexico uh, and spends a couple days, in this case, Athens, Georgia, Mr. Brown Jones. They uh, head to New York, and here you see David Alpin, another image from it's such a modern photograph. And when you look at this in the exhibit, Look at it closely. It could have been taken in 2018 based on the architecture, based on the, the setting. Everything about it is so contemporary. But December 7th, 1941 arrives at the same time in the New York. They have to cut their trip short and they retreat back to California to Wildcat Hill and they assume a wartime posture there. Uh, and here you see, in fact, this is one of the photographs he sent to his sister, uh, Mary, that he sent in an envelope and folded it, and you see the crease right across the middle. Uh, and he describes it in a note to Mary. Uh, this is Xmas Eve, picture of our place. Points of interest, Karis on the roof uh, with two cats over her room. The right end of the building is a tool and woodshed. Just beyond is our main house, which is one big room, and it really is. To the right is a garage. In the foreground, you see sections of a recently felled tree, which has not been split. It's tough going. On the extreme right, you can see corner of State Highway Number 1, and of course, you will note our proximity to the Pacific. Boys arrive tomorrow morn. Much love from E and C to you all. Now, it's the wartime. There's rationing. He's not going to travel much. Um, and he starts a new path. Uh, and he's often criticized for taking this tack where he starts to take pictures. My most recent work has been with my cats. We have 26. <laughs> this is what I want for variety, both in photo photography and writing. We hope to have a book on cats. It will be different. <laughs> now, for all of my love of Edward Reston photographs and him as a great icon, this is getting a little too close to going back to pictorialism, but the cat's named, the kitten is named Mary in homage to his sister. Um, and surprisingly or not surprisingly, because by this time 
Uh, he has already gotten considerable fame. He's had an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. They published The Cats of Wildcat Hill. Karras wrote the book and he obviously did the pictures and it was done in 1947. That same year though, uh, he embarks upon really the last important challenge as a photographer and could particularly daunting, and that was taking photographs in color. Now, by this time though, Weston's life takes uh, a dramatic turn uh, on the personal side for the worst. He's suffering from Parkinson's, and it's really only another year that he's actually able to take pictures or work in the dark room. Uh, his marriage to Karis, the one true uh, love of his life, uh, had disintegrated. She wanted children. The 28 year difference of age uh, made that impossible for him uh, on many levels. Uh, and then he was now left alone. But he was approached by the Eastman Kodak Company to shoot color for promotion of their transparency films, Ektachrome and Kodachrome. And Weston accepted the challenge with glee. In color, I had to learn new ways of seeing. I tried my lifelong to open the eyes of everyone, my own eyes too, by showing how extraordinary the most simple things in this wide and wonderful world are. I mean, that encapsulates Edward Weston's mission in life. I'll tell you a quick little uh, aside. One day in my office, Jack uh, comes in, his uh, grandnephew, and he's got a stack of boxes, and they are Kodak 8x10 color boxes. And I said, Jack, what do you have? And there he had a big rubber band around him. He said, oh, I found this in a closet, and I thought you might like to see them. They were eight boxes of 80 color transparencies that had not seen the light of day literally since 1947. And, I, and on the outside of the box was Edward Weston's scrawl, which I know very well. And I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, Nancy Newhall, who was his great friend and, and uh, also edited the uh, day books for him, Color for Weston, with all of its crudities and limitations, was an exploration into another technique and another vision. He found in it no conflict with black and white. There are subjects that come alive only in color, and there are subjects that only come alive in, in black and white, the sharp magic of black and white. Color to him was like finding another hand or eye. It was an extension of the photographer's scope through which he may now discover the world again. I mean, that, the quest for the new and the aesthetic and the beautiful uh, never ended. Uh, she wrote a, an obituary for him in modern photography, and I think it's a fitting conclusion to the story of his life uh, and uh, my presentation. On New Year's Eve, or New Year's morning, 1958, Edward Weston died. He was 71 and a victim of Parkinson's disease. Death for him was a release from helplessness. For his family, four sons, seven grandchildren, two great-grandchildren, for hundreds who, down the years, came to the simple shack overlooking the Pacific like pilgrims to a shrine, and for thousands to whom his work had been a revelation. His death left a huge gap on the horizon, a gap to be filled only by renewed dedication to the ideal toward which his life had been a passionate journey. And the Weston that we know today uh, is the Weston that we revere comes through in these images. That morning he had arisen and struggled to a chair that overlooked his beloved Pacific and quietly died there. His uh, ashes were then scattered at Point Lobos. And from all around the world, letters and, and wires and tributes came in, plans for exhibitions and publications, memorials pouring in. His presence seemed very strong. Commenting on this overwhelming flood of sympathy, his sons concluded, now that he is dead, he is more alive than ever. And today, as you see this exhibition, I would have to grant that to be very true, that with his photography, he lives on forever. Thank you very much, and thank you, Richard, for having me here today.